Welcome. We're delighted that you've chosen to take this experience that you're about to go on. The University of Houston Energy and our Center for Carbon Management is proud to bring you this eight-part series entitled CCUS, the linchpin for the energy transition. You know, this series could not be made possible without the support of our UH community and the industry partners and the contributions of the subject matter experts that will be providing globally recognized expertise for you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name's Chuck McConnell. I'm the actual director of the Center for Carbon Management here at the university. I spent 32 years in industry uh, working for a company called Praxair, running global businesses around the world and also domestically. I spent a little bit of time at the Battelle Memorial Institute running the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership in the Midwest. And then had the pleasure and the honor of serving in the Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary of Energy, responsible for fossil fuels and responsible for a lot of the work that went into CCUS through the pilots, demonstration, and the continued research that supported CCUS over the years. But after serving in Washington, I came back to Houston and how have the privilege of running our Center for Carbon Management and Energy at the university. It was really a center that was driven by the desires of our Energy Advisory Board here at the university, by the many industries that we serve and, and those companies and industries and the community in general. And it's important that we are able to take the capabilities here at the university and move them toward large scale solutions for carbon management. CCUS as a linchpin to the energy transition is really what's going to enable the emissions reduction in the energy industries. The industries that we serve, oil and gas, petrochemicals, electric power, cement, steel, and a host of other manufacturing industries. And this is a challenge that's global. We need more energy and less emissions. And that's the mission. It's not to choose fuels. It's not to make a choice around technology, but to create a portfolio of solutions that can allow emissions to be reduced. And that's the essence of CCUS in terms of impact to the industry and the marketplace. Hi, I'm Ramanan Krishnamurthy. I'm the Vice President for Energy and Innovation at the University of Houston. Uh, we fondly call it the Energy University. Uh, and you will soon see why we call it the Energy University. The University of Houston is a young university. We're 95 years old, not the 300 or 350 that other universities are. And yet, we are in the energy capital of the world. We made it a focal point to advance energy-related education, research, and communications about energy-related topics to the common public as a priority. This priority has led the university to become the energy university over the last 15 years. The input we get from our energy advisory board, 25 of the top individuals in the energy industry in the greater Houston region led us to, to build our focused efforts in the area of carbon management. We essentially captured that by talking about it with a single line. It's the emissions, not the fuels. That single line exemplifies what the Center for Carbon Management and Energy has generated over the last five years. It is a focus on how do we reduce emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, without particular focus on the fuel, because that is our existential challenge today. Our existential challenge are greenhouse gases that are being let into the atmosphere that are causing the global temperature to rise. Our focus has to be on reduction of those greenhouse gases. That is what we call as energy sustainability or environmental sustainability of the energy paradigm. 
our Center for Carbon Management and Energy has put that as a focal point along with affordable and reliable energy forming that holy triangle, if you will, that we must address. That addressing of that holy triangle of affordable, reliable, and environmentally sustainable energy leads to what we believe uh, a natural conclusion to look at carbon capture, utilization, and storage as the key topic that must be advanced over the next 10 years to 15 years and become global scale in addressing the challenges. The University of Houston has taken that challenge on and, has ad and is addressing it through education, through research, and through outreach programs that address not only the science and technology, but address policy, regulation, and equity. And perhaps the biggest contribution that the university will provide is coming up with that next generation of workforce that is going to be ready to take on the biggest challenges in the world and deliver value back by keeping energy affordable, reliable, and environmentally sustainable. Our first session will be driven by some good friends and colleagues of ours here at the university from McKinsey. And in that conversation, they'll be looking at the kinds of decision makers there are around the world. Is it an industry? Is it companies? Is it people? And the decisions they'll have in front of them, the choices that they have, and what frames that? What frames it is risk and impact and relevance, and putting all that together to come up with the best solution. There's a million solutions. Thank you, Chuck, for that. Uh kind introduction. Let me just quickly summarize what we're going to plan to do today. We're first going to go through three hopefully short presentations that will lay out some of the basic concepts that we want to provide and then we'll open up for Q&A. I'm going to start off talking a bit about the role of carbon capture use and storage and really lay out just how important it is if we are going to achieve our global aspirations to get to net zero emissions in the future. Then I'm going to head it over to Greg who's going to talk a bit about uh, the overall economics. He'll talk about some of the drivers of the economics of carbon capture and storage and, and the differences between different types of projects. And then Clint will do a, a, a perspective on the role of hubs, how important hubs are to make the economics work overall, and how we see hub growth around the world playing out. So let me just start off a little bit with the discussion around the role. I just want to use this analogy of, of a bathtub to describe the two roles that carbon capture and storage play. You know, a bathtub, you have a faucet that puts water into the bathtub, and you have a plug that lets water leave. And if you think about uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, that's like water in the tub. And carbon capture and storage can do two things. One, like the faucet, where you can constrain the flow of water into the tub, carbon capture and storage can be used in industrial facilities, chemical plants, refineries, power plants, steel, chem uh, cement, and they will reduce the amount of emissions that go into the atmosphere. So this is one big role. But it also plays another role, which is vital if we think about the, the future getting to net zero emissions. And that is it can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Direct air capture is, is one mechanism where you can capture the, air, uh, the CO2 out of the air and then you put it into the ground. So it's this dual role of, of reducing emissions going into the atmosphere and then taking it out. So my talk today is indeed, Chuck mentioned, on sources and systems. CO2 capture conventionally. And why? So CO2, of course, you, we need to know where it comes from. We need to know how to actually deploy the different systems and what technologies to deploy into those systems. There's three key parts of what I'll be talking to you today about. So categorizing the various streams to capture CO2 from. It's the first part of what I'll be taking you through today. Providing then an overview of how CO2 capture systems can be applied to various streams. And then thirdly, providing an overview of the CO2 capture technologies that are used within those CO2 capture systems. 
I'll then complete my talk with a brief history of CO2 capture experience across, across the different sources and systems. Now my object objective today is to provide you with an understanding of CO2 capture, where it can be applied, how it is applied, and what technologies underpin it. Thank you, Chuck. Well, I appreciate being with you today to talk about one of my favorite things, and that's transportation. So I want to start with talking about CCUS. So it's a great acronym. We have the carbon capture, which you've heard about. We have the use and storage, which you're going to hear about during the next sec section. But where is the T in the acronym? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, the end of the CCUS technology chain. Uh, so after the CO2 is captured, after it's uh, compressed and transported, it's then, as Chuck said, stored through injection and geologic formations to be sequestered permanently or stored through mineralization or stored biologically, or it can be utilized to produce products such as chemicals, fertilizers, or building materials. The question is, what is the global dialogue going to be about how we can assist the developing world to raise its standard of living achieve its development goals without actually constraining them based on the fact that we've already used up the carbon budget in the developed nations. So with that, let's get into international drivers. I'm going to talk about domestic drivers too, but international drivers really ought to move the needle more than anything. Um, the first, I'll just start with something that's frankly not debated, and that is that societies that have access to reliable electricity live better by ever, every measure from a quality of life indices. Whether it's childhood uh, survival, in other words, infant mortality rates drop precipitously the more you electrify a society. Um, uh, life expectancies increase significantly. Those are related, of course, to the impact of, of, of nutrition and clean water, both of which are tied to availability of electricity. And then, of course, education. The ability to have enough time, especially for the women of the world, to achieve educational goals and development goals, um, that is one of the most compelling aspects that electricity and energy bring to a society that far too many people in the world do not currently have. So let's talk about that. So thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions. I'm going to return back to the provocative statement I started with which is there is no way we can accomplish the climate mitigation goals that we have in a moral or practical way without carbon capture utilization and storage because any scenario that ma integrates massive deprivation of energy to reach climate goals is, a, is an unacceptable outcome for a huge component of the world. And given that the developed nations are the ones who got us here, it is not appropriate for us to do energy deprivation climate policy. It's important for us to do human flourishing climate policy through technology. So thank you for your attention and I'll look forward to questions. I think probably to start, Scott, you, you started us all off with a global overview of the world and the expectations of different parts of the world, et cetera. And just kind of over the top, you know, we've talked about scaling up here in the U.S. and then ultimately scaling up globally. Well, what do you see as the biggest opportunities and maybe some of the biggest threats? Well, thanks for that good opening question, Chuck. But I, I think I would start off by saying is that you can sense from everybody in the group uh, optimism that now is a moment when we can actually achieve some scale up in carbon capture and storage. And at the same time, you can tell from each of the discussions that we had in the last sessions, that is a very complicated set of issues that had to kind of get worked through. So this sense of optimism and recognizing the complexity. And I would say from a U.S. point of view on the scale up, if we would have been talking six months ago, I think the big challenge would have been from the people I talked to is the economics still just don't work. 45Q is close, but, but not quite there. And then with the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, 
all of a sudden now there's more juice out there and people are going back and saying, wait a second, we can make it work. And, and I think we'll see in many companies plan for 2023 that they're going to come out with some real projects now that can actually begin to get this ball rolling in a big way. So once you get the economics behind this, the next challenge becomes the nitty gritty around permitting, siting, regulatory approval. And that whole knot we're going to have to kind of work on to really get the whole industry to sort through all these issues going forward. So I think that's the biggest challenge going forward. Well, that's why CCUS is so important. And so I hope you're excited to begin the rest of this journey. And let's move on to session two and get going.